pelvic fractures in general, believe it or not, are actually fairly associated with a high mortality. So you're talking about any pelvic fracture is about a five to 10% mortality. Now, that's not exactly fair because there's a lot of things that are associated with it. Patients that have significant blunt injury that come in dead and we're resuscitating them on autopsy they may have a pelvic fracture. So this gets included in there. But pelvic fractures are, are significant because in general they're indicative of a high mechanism of energy. And one thing that we're gonna go into showing is why pelvic fractures can be so mortal. Because pelvic fractures tend to bleed a great deal. So you've got bleeding from the arteries we'll show you about, the veins, the bone itself, which is, is pretty significant. And then it's also at risk for not just bleeding, but also other injuries that may be within the patient. So those are things to think about. That's why when we think of pelvic fractures, yeah, we think, okay, there's a little pelvic fracture here. A little we have to see the type of pelvic fracture it is, because that makes a big difference in terms of what the patient could be actually experiencing. All right, now this is basically the pelvis as a drawing, and I think it's a good one. It's probably one of the best drawings that, um, that's out there. So this is the ilium, the big, the big bones of the wing, and these are the pubic rami right here, okay, which you guys all know. Pubic symphysis right here. Here's the sacrum, and here's the sacroiliac joints. All right, now, here's the one thing about pelvic fractures is that if you break it in one place, it's like a pretzel. You can't just break a pretzel off into one place. It has to break somewhere else. So that's the general key about a pelvic fracture. If you have a break in one part, there's probably gonna be a break somewhere else. I don't know the exact percentage, but it's pretty high. And that's always what we think about too. If you see a break somewhere, where else has the patient have the fracture? Because that's, that's gonna be pretty significant. You're gonna see that for sure. And remember, there's lots of ligaments that are in here. That's what makes the pelvic so flexible. For when you're giving birth in a female, the pelvis is able to really stretch out, and all these ligaments are the ones that are responsible for that. Where's Jean? There's Jean. <laughs> and I don't see Tanya here. So anyways, that's just get ready. Here it comes. But my, my point is, is that the ligaments are very important. Now, there's a reason that this is also something we have to think about in injury. Because pelvises, during the moment of injury or trauma, can snap, and the ligaments will snap it back. Right. Why is that important? Because a pelvis fracture that we see that may be actively bleeding could have actually snapped open at the time of injury. Blood vessels can tear and then snap right back because of these ligaments. So that's something to think about when you're seeing patients with bad pelvic fractures, is that there is that effect of the ligaments can bring that pelvis right back together, yet not necessarily give you the, the clue that this patient had a significant trauma and a significant injury. All right, now. <clears throat> all the red and blue stuff. So here's your aorta, and here's your iliac vein. Actually, this is your common iliac right here. No, I'm sorry, this is the aorta. Here's your common iliac right here. Here's branch one, here's branch two. Now let's take, this is the right side. So let's take the right side. Now the right branches into the external iliac artery, which eventually goes into your femoral artery, which goes into your leg. It also branches into what's called the internal iliac artery. Some people call that the hypogastrix. So you may have heard that term being tossed around. Here's the internal iliac artery. You can see it branches. And now, rather than go through all these crazy things that we had to go through in med school and nursing school, all these different arteries, just, just look at all that redness there. All right, that's just bad. Okay. So if you have a fracture, here's some ligaments right here that you can see. If the fracture opens up, can you imagine these arteries also ripping open? And that's what we get worried about when we're calling about a retroperitoneal hematoma or, or when we go to angiography. We'll show you a little bit of that. By the way, Lisa, it's really good to see you again. I haven't seen you since you've been back. Okay, so that's, that's something to think about. And just remember when you're seeing a patient who's bleeding from the pelvic fracture, I hope you remember this picture. Just all the red and blue. And what's more important than, than necessarily the red, it's also the veins and the, and the blue, because the veins you cannot embolize through arteriography. Remember, it's just the arteries. So it's also to think, something to think about as you think of what we're going through in our thought process about how to manage this. Sandy? Embolized? Yeah, embolized? It's not the common iliac, it's the internal iliac. The internal. Yes. Because, see what the internal iliac is right here? Now all this red stuff that I was pointing out to you, that comes off of the internal iliac directly. So if there's a lot of these red things that are bleeding, I'll show you a picture of that in a second. The safest and quickest thing to do is to nail that internal iliac. Now, our patient in bed seven, 
okay, Mr. Mr. O. Remember, he had, I actually was the one who resuscitated him. I don't know what nurses were there at the time. Oh, Joel, you were there. That was a bad one. And, and you know, we took him in the operating room. We had to do some stuff in the OR from the internal abdominal standpoint with his colon and so forth. Orthopedics was fixing his legs. Then we got him to Angio. He was bleeding significantly. I have his x-rays up here, by the way. He was bleeding pretty significantly. And what they did is they coiled off the internal iliacs bilaterally, both of them. Now, why is that bad for a patient down the road? One, impotence, all right? Which, which in a gentleman, a young gentleman like that, is obviously very important. Two, and that's exactly what happened with him, was gluteal necrosis. Why? Because look at all these vessels. Look at these vessels here, called the inferior gluteal artery, the, um, the, um, or the obturator artery, the superior gluteal artery. These arteries are the ones that irrigate your gluteus muscle. If you're to ligate those arteries, that gluteus muscle is going to die off. Now, luckily, the Lord intended us to have lots of different supply from all over the place. But occasionally, you will have patients that do, in fact, necrose the gluteal muscles. That's what happened with Herodonia. So has that, has that, have, have most of you seen his wound? In the, it's a bad one. Now, he's messed up to begin. There's something wrong with him. Nothing gets, he doesn't ever get better about anything. So he's this bad protoplasm to begin with. And I don't understand why a guy in his 20s would have that. But nevertheless, he suffered this complication. Oh, legs the legs were lost for two reasons. One is the femoral artery goes down and then branches off, of, obviously, into your tibial artery. And your, those arteries are severely damaged because of his motorcycle accidents. And he also developed a compartment syndrome on top of that. And he developed a lot of just shearing of his muscle. And that really caused the problems. By the way, did anyone notice that La Jolla Laura is wearing fancy shoes? I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> okay, now, remember, not only do we have, I don't mean to make you red, Lois. Not only do we have vessels, all right, but we have a lot of nerves. And we don't think about this very often in the acute trauma patients and the trauma patients in the ICU, but the nerve injuries that can happen after pelvic fractures can be significant in terms of the patient's rehabilitation status. Patients' inability to walk properly, ability to feel, nerve injury and chronic pain, that can all be significant. So what I'm showing you here, this is obviously the sciatica that comes out of the bottom portions. And there's a lot of different nerves that can reach even top, a lot of cutaneous, a lot of these things can cause some problems later on. So these are things that can happen long term, but certainly probably for it. <clears throat> this is just one example of what I would say a fairly minor pelvic fracture, but nevertheless something you have to see. Okay, can I convince you that the sacroiliac is disrupted here? Look at, see that kind of black stuff over here compared to this nice smooth line over here? Now remember what I said? It's a pretzel. So if one thing's gonna be broken, other things gonna be broken. Well, let's look at the rami. Uh-oh, uh-oh. So the inferior and superior right rami are also fractured, okay? So that's just one example of a pelvic injury, a pelvic fracture in one part is generally indicative of a pelvic fracture in another part, okay? It's just like a pretzel. I don't want to go into all the different types of classifications, but in general there are three major classifications of pelvic fracture. There's the lateral compression. This is what you get when you get T-boned on the side, all right? This tends to be the most common, as I mentioned, T-bones, piece of risotto. Um, and in general, these are pretty benign. They don't really cause the significant bleeding that you see in our patient in bed seven right now. And here's a rami fracture right here, a little bit of ligamentous disruption right here, and that's what you get from the lateral. Now, AP compression, these are really bad. Both the AP compression and the vertical shear injuries are bad, but these ones are really bad because you get the open book look. Now, remember, as I said before, the ligaments keep the pelvis nice and coiled. So you get the open book that snaps back into place. If it remains open booked, you can imagine there's a significant amount of ligamentous damage as well. That's why orthopedic colleagues in general have to plate these things and bring it back together. All right, and you get disruption of these ligaments. And in these patients, they generally do have pelvic vascular injuries that we have to think about if in fact they're bleeding, okay? Vertical shears are the ones that you get when you're falling from height. All right, and you can see that you get a lot of ligamentous disruption, and this is where you can get your sacroiliac disruption up here as well. Okay, you can get some in the AP as well, but more so in the vertical shear. So posterior elemental disruption, 
can cause significant unstable pelvic fractures, and these things really can bleed pretty significantly. Okay, so those are important to know. The fracture pattern is important because the fraction pattern, as I told you earlier, can generally lead to patients that are in fact hemorrhaging. All right, so it's not, I don't want to go over the article in general, but just remember that patients that have specific fractures, those with unstable pelvic fractures tend to bleed. All right, that's just the bottom line. So we always ask, with, now I know in ATLS and, and when we're doing, we kind of do this in the pelvis and rock the pelvis, we probably shouldn't be doing that because if it's, if it's bad, you're just going to make it worse. And you know, the patient that has a gunshot wound to the arm is going to have an unstable pelvis. But it's just kind of practice habits we do that. So I always tell the house staff, just rock it gently. If they're having pain there, then think about imaging further. If they're not, just leave it be. You don't have to keep going and making sure that you actually get no uh, rocking or, or unstable pelvis at all. Why am I showing you this slide? I'm showing you this slide to show you that patients with a stable fracture versus an unstable fracture, those with a stable fracture, if they're bleeding, they're probably bleeding from the belly, okay? Those with an unstable fracture, if they're bleeding, they're probably ble bleeding from the pelvis. And same thing right here, if you look at active pelvic arterial hemorrhage, or I shouldn't say probably bleeding from the pelvis, they have a higher chance of bleeding from the pelvis. And if you have pelvic artery hemorrhage, you can see <coughs> only 10% of those happen in a stable fracture versus 60% happening in an unstable pelvic fracture. Again, unstable pelvic fractures bleed more. Okay, now, this is why mortality can be really high in these patients. Listen, Mr. O in bed seven isn't out of the woods yet, all right? We've kept him going for a long time, but you know, the, the, lots of bad things can still happen, and, and are happening for that matter. And that's why the mortality rate is 40 to 60%. And those are even in this decade. So it's a bad injury, bad, bad injury. All right, these are the hemodynamically unstable pelvic fracture like Mr. O in bed seven, okay? Now, open fractures are even higher, 70%. Why? Because open fractures, they not only bleed out from the pelvis in the field, but they have a very high propensity of infection. I remember a patient to this day, um, Anna Tapia, in 2007, she died, fulminant sepsis. She had an open pelvic fracture on the floor, and we you know, were doing our best to kind of do dressing changes and packing, and then one day she became floridly septic and died, and she was in her 40s. So um, these things are really, really bad injuries. Despite our antibiotics, despite our aggressive operative debridement, we still lose the battle in these patients, and that's why the mortality is so high. Okay, so what I often tell the house staff is on a pelvic fracture, it's very important to do a rectal exam to make sure there are no bony fragments that protrude out into the rectum. We should do it, we probably don't do it enough. We should be doing vaginal exams on females that have bad pelvic fractures as well to make sure that the pelvis isn't protruding into the vaginal vaults. All right, we kind of rely a little bit too much on imaging. We should probably do the exam ourselves. So those are things to think about. Remember that in order to evaluate these patients, you have to make sure that these patients are hemodynamically stable. And you have to try to figure out what they're bleeding from, all right? There's no good way to assess whether the patients are truly bleeding in the retroperitoneum from just your clinical exam. Right? You need help to do that, and that's why we have the help of radiology and so forth to do that. And there's no way that you can tell if it's artery versus venous bleeding based on your physical exam. That's where the imaging can help. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Okay, intraoperatively, this is what we see in a retroperitoneal hematoma. Okay, so this is kind of the colon spread over. And this is a big, huge, massive hematoma that's coming up in the retroperitoneum emanating from a bad pelvic fracture. All right, now, you can see why you don't want to rush in and open this up in the operating room. Because if you open that up, right, now you've got a tamponade that has been unleashed and the patient's going to bleed. Right? Sometimes these things open up on their own. There's not much you can do about it. But it's something you have to really, really be careful of. Okay? So this is what we talk about. We talk about retroperitoneal hematoma. This is what it looks like intraoperatively. All right? You don't want to open these things up if you absolutely can avoid to do so. Now, there are advanced ways that we're able to treat these bad fractures, okay? In general, um, we know that we have to make sure the patient isn't bleeding. And let's just look at the bottom thing. That's why in patients that come in hemodynamically unstable with pelvic fractures, that's when we start activating our massive transfusion protocol. Blood, FFP, get the base deficit, see where they are, and then sometimes lactate levels if, if you're in different institutions. Here we've got a pretty good lab that gives a reliable base deficit, which can help us. Does everyone know what a base deficit means, by the way? Chemically, 
So base deficit is a measure of your acid. Gina, what do you think a base deficit means? Yeah. That's exactly right. But you can measure that through lactate. We, didn't, we tend to do a base deficit. Does everyone remember what the chemical reason is why a base deficit? So base deficit is a value that gives you how much bicarbonate you need to normalize your pH. So if your base deficit is minus 11, you need 11 milliequivalents of bicarb to normalize your pH. It's a laboratory assessed value. So it's a surrogate for acidosis. Just as Gene was saying, if you're not getting enough oxygen because of lack of blood, you're going to develop an acidosis, all right? Which is why we, we prefer that in the operating room, or even the recess bay for that matter, not to give bicarb, because if we artificially give bicarb, we will correct our base deficit, and yet the patient still may be in shock, and we're not getting an idea what the patient's shock status is. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, I just thought I'd bring it out there. Okay, so... Um, we talked a little about the venous, it's hard to tell what's going on, but venous structure is bad and then artery bleeding can, can be overcome because of that tamponade effect. You can still get bleeding into that tamponade and gets worse and worse. Let me show you um, a little bit what the solutions are. I'll show you some pictures about this later on. So when you're bleeding from a pelvic fracture, you've got to control the bleeding from the bony surface. That's what the mechanical stabilization is all about. And I'll show you pictures of the binder and how that works. And you guys know how it works, but I'll show you how it works from a radiologic standpoint. Bleeding from the arterial injury, that's the embolization. And then bone bleeding and venous bleeding are kind of hand in hand. Again, we try to decrease the pelvic volume of the binder and hopefully tamponade more and, and, and improve that tamponade effect that I showed you in that one picture. All right, and I'll show you a little bit of the controversy here. Arterial embolization does not stop all bleeding because it won't stop the venous bleeding. All right, so we got those big vessels. Remember I showed you that picture of all the red and the blue? It'll stop the red, but it won't stop the blue. All right, so that's one of the limitations of arterial injuries. And again, we don't know what portion of the pelvic fracture is bleeding from the artery, the vein, or the bone. And remember, there are consequences to ligating the arterial artery because after, after all, if you ligate the iliac artery, you can get the gluteal necrosis and you can get the impotence and all those types of things. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, remember that there are other complications that we have to think about. There is a retroperitoneal image, we talked about that. <coughs> Pelvic fractures in general have a 10 to 20% concomitant rate of genitourinary injuries. So that's why these patients are generally getting cystograms. And if you have blood at the meatus of the penis or if you have a, if a, a large scrotal hematoma, we have to be worried about a urethral injury because those patients can have significant GU injuries. So we really have to make sure that's the case. So bladder and the urethra are very important. And I already talked about the neurologic injury because all those nerves are running back there. Okay, now. How do we mechanically stabilize? And I'll show you pictures here in a second. Well, if we stabilize, we can decrease the bony motion, causing increased injury. We can hopefully bring some of that bone back together. And we can reduce the pelvic volume so that the arteries aren't shearing and kind of bleeding into space. We're gonna kind of tighten that down and increase the tamponade effect. So has, have, have all of you used a pelvic sheet in the past? It works pretty well, all right? But it's a little crude. And you have to put the towel clamps on, and then you got to take them off, and it can cause skin necrosis. So the pelvic sheets work pretty well, but they're not ideal. All right. And then that's why we're using the teapot or the, the, the pelvic binder that we use. And that's a pretty good device. And I think we use it in, in um, Mr. O in bed seven, and, and, I'll, and I'll show you a picture of his actual films. And um, uh, it, it works pretty well. And you'll be surprised how well it worked on him. Now, the external fixator is what the orthopods will use. Eventually, that's what they're going to have to use to bring that pelvis together. But in the interim, they don't do it immediately. It takes a little bit of time to get to the operating room, but that's what we do in the trauma bay. And then have, it, have you ever guys seen a C-clamp? C-clamps are kind of a thing of the past, but that was one thing that you could use, and I'll show you a picture of that. Basically, it's this big, massive clamp that goes around the AIS joints. It looks like a C, and it just tightens the pelvis together. So this is kind of an example. This is a, it's not exactly the, the, the teapot that we're using, but it's pretty close. And this is the pelvic binder. It goes right over the hips, right over the AS joints, and we bring it together. This is the old school pelvic sheet. Um, patients don't really like it. It does kind of hurt, and we just have to, uh, you know, once you put it on, the knot never stays, so you always wind up putting towel clamps on it, and that just doesn't work very well. So this is Mr. O. Look at this. Look at how bad that was. So we saw that, we thought he, he's not gonna make, I mean, I thought for sure that you know, he's gonna die. But 
we put the teapot on and look at the reduction that we had here. So, you know, it was pretty substantial um, and it worked pretty well. So again, pretty bad, reduced nicely and that hopefully will improve the tamponade effect. So do you guys understand now why the, the pelvic binders are so important in these patients with bad pelvic fractures, the unstable pelvic fractures? Because this reducing the pelvic, now imagine, it just looks like it wants to, this just looks like it wants to bleed, doesn't it? But you have all this huge massive space back here, it just wants to bleed, right? This doesn't look like it's gonna wanna bleed as much. Now unfortunately, he did keep bleeding, but can you imagine the amount of blood loss would have happened had we, had we not had that tamponade? So that was, that was, I think, an important aspect in his care, and maybe we got him through that night because of this. This is the external fixator that you guys have seen all the time. You know, that's no, no big mystery here. Again, it's a close of on. That's that sleek hemp I was talking about. Has anyone ever seen this? Okay, so we don't use it very often anymore, but it has been used in the past, both here and abroad. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if the pods have one anymore. They're, they're pretty good about putting external fixers on pretty quickly, so it's not really needed as much anymore. But the idea, the principle is all the same, whether it's a sheet, you know, the teapot, the X-Fix, the c clamp it's to reduce the pelvic volume and to prevent the ongoing bleeding. All right, now let's get to angiography because what we have to determine is one, is the patient in fact bleeding into the pelvis? All right, and that's where we can, the CT scans can be helpful. Two, and really frankly in the trauma situation equally as important is are there any other injuries associated with this patient that could be causing ongoing hemorrhage? And that's the abdominal injuries that in this Mr. O's case, we actually did take him to the operating room to in fact take out a portion of his colon at the time because he did have a lot of bleeding from his mesentery. The only way that we could adequately determine that ideally is through CT scanning or through exploration without a CT scan. We prefer to do the, la the, the former than the latter because we can also get information on the pelvis. I'll show you some examples of that. So in general, we don't embolize a lot of patients, less than 10% of pelvic fractures. Um, we'll show you some angiography evidence of what that looks like when a patient's bleeding. And what they do is they put a bunch of coils inside and that, those coils tampen on the bleeding effect, all right? Now here's an example of a CT scan that you have active extravasation. So you see this white, the arrows kind of give it away, but you see the white here, you see the white here? That's active extravasation of contrast, all right? That's why we use IV contrast, because it lights up. Now, what I'm not showing you is the delayed images. It's really important we do delayed images because if, in fact, you see this white blush in the delay images, you know that patient, in fact, is bleeding. Because if it was just contained within the blood vessel, the delayed images would show it gone and out. But if it's sitting out there, that means it's already out of the blood and it's sitting there, and that's the contrast that you see. Right? So when we see this, that's when we get on the phone and call our IR folks, and that's when you guys get all mad and know that we're going to be in the IR suite for a long time. But obviously, that's where the patient needs to be. Remember that picture I showed you intraoperatively, that retroperitoneal hematoma? All right? That's why we don't take these patients to the operating room. Because if I were to get in there like we used to and open up that retroperitoneal hematoma, it is going to be massively bloody. All right? So the IR folks can do this without getting into the retroperitoneal hematoma. Now, let's take a step back. Sometimes we don't have a choice. The patient's dying and crashing. We have to go into the operating room and do whatever we can do to fix the patient. And I'll show some pictures of some tricks that we can do to do that. But we can also actually embolize the patient ourselves by isolating the intrailiacs and injecting slurry into the intrailiac artery. We don't like to do that because it is a messy procedure and patients tend to bleed a lot more. But that is something that we can do if we absolutely have to, and I have done it myself personally, but the outcomes are generally pretty dismal. Okay, so that's active extravasation. So the idea is that when you see active extravasation through angiography, when we see this large pelvic blood or hematoma, we can actually stick coils in. And that's why these patients are in fact unstable in the angio suite. They're getting product, they're getting blood, and the radiologists are working to get this image. So do you see that black mushroom right here? That's active extravasation. Now let's go back to our anatomy. Here's the aorta. Here's common iliac. Here's external iliac right here, and here's the internal iliac, and it's the internal iliac artery and all those blood vessels. See all those blood vessels? That's what's bleeding. Here's another picture. Again, 
Here's the internal way I can look at all those blood vessels bleeding, all that blush, kind of that fluffy stuff, that's all active bleeding. So when you see that, as Kathy was asking earlier, there's only one solution here, and that's to just put a coil into the internal iliac so all this bleeding will hopefully stop. And they're pretty good about doing that if we have to. Okay, so that's the, and, and a lot of you that have seen these patients have noticed that once they actually coil that bleeder, within minutes the patient actually starts to improve hemodynamically. So it does work, but it does take some effort to do so and ongoing resuscitation from, from the team's part to make it happen. Now, what are some predictor factors that patients that may need an embolization, females, because of the, the widened pelvis, um, obviously patients that are hypotensive and iliac joint disruption. We looked at this um, at UCSD, we looked at our experience over nine years, and we only have about four patients that go to angiography that have pelvic fractures. That makes about sense if you think about you know, the patients you've taken care of that have pelvic fractures. Only about 4% are actually going. So roughly one out of every 20 patients are going to the operating room for, uh, or to the angio suite for a pelvic fracture session. And out of those, only 18 had actual, out of the 31 patients, only 18 actually needed embolization. The rest of them were negative angiographies. Okay, and obviously if they're really complicated fractures, that's what's gonna pre uh, uh, lead to more pelvic fracture embolization. It doesn't help with the venous injury. These venous injuries come from small, medium veins. It usually stops when the patient's cardiac function actually gets a little bit better because their coagula coagulation profile gets better and that helps tampon on the bleeding. And again, that retroperitoneum is just a bad area where that tamponade can, can really get bigger and bigger and you can lose several liters of blood in that area. Okay, now I wanna to talk to you in the last couple moments about preperitoneal packing. Do you guys know what preperitoneal packing is? All right, I'm just gonna show you the pictures here. Preperitoneal packing is a way that we can, remember how I showed you we're closing the space down? Well, what if we actually operatively close the space down even more by getting lap pads or sponges into that pelvic space, into the hematoma, to actually just direct pressure on the vessels that are bleeding? Right, that's what the preperitoneal packing is, okay? So here's a picture of it. What we basically do is we make an incision right above the pubic symphysis right here. So that's the incision right here. There's one finger right here, one finger here. We don't get into the peritoneum. Instead, we, we kind of work behind the, uh, in front of the peritoneum and then eventually in back of the peritoneum so we can wrap our hands all the way into the retroperitoneum and place packs all the way back there. So these, see how this is bulging? That's because packs are being placed all the way back there. And the idea of the packs is that kind of like an open belly, but in this case, the belly's never really open. We're just getting behind the retroperitoneum. The packs can increase the tamponade effect. That's important for everyone to hear about because you will be seeing patients like this more and more as we start packing more during this technique. It's a fairly new technique that's becoming in vogue right now. Does anyone have any questions on preperitoneal packing? We do it within moments they arrive from the trauma base. So once we figure out what's going on, we figure out they're bleeding to death, figure out it's probably from a pelvic fracture, then what we can do is actually do some preperitoneal packing. I probably should have done this with Mr. O. I didn't because I actually had to make a midline exploratory laparotomy to fix his colon that was actively bleeding. So I felt that I wouldn't be able to get a good plane to get my preperitoneal packs in. So, but had he not had internal bleeding from his colonic mesentery, then he would have been a perfect patient to try preperitoneal packing. Exactly, so what this does, it's a bridging way, it's just like a, a C-clamp, excuse me, um, a teapot or a, or a pelvic binder. It increases the tamponade, we get him now to IR, we shoot the angiography, hopefully stop the bleeding, leave this in probably for another 24 hours. Yes, we do do it in the operating room, but we theoretically could do it out of the operating room, but we would do this only in the operating room because the light, lighting's better, the equipment's better. And then maybe 24 hours later, we'll take him back to the operating room and take these packs out, okay? This is probably going, the teapot's always going to be first, because that's going to be done in the trauma bay. Then we get the patient down to CT, see active extravasation, we call IR, while we're waiting, we take the patient to the operating room, and we do the preperitoneal packing. Then we go right from the operating room to the angio suite. Madeline? Yeah, so what we're doing here is, I'm showing you, there's an incision in the midline of the abdomen, but it's not an X lap incision. It's not going into the belly. We're not going to get intestine coming. We're going to stay preperitoneal. That's why it's called preperitoneal packing. And then we're going to reach all the way around, almost touching the patient's spine, 
Because you can do that, right? You can put your hand all the way around. And remember, the patient has a active bleeding, so that's going to cause that space to occur. So the, the kind of the, the dissection is done for you by the bleeding, and then get your packs in all the way around it. The fascia is open, but the peritoneum is closed. So we're underneath the fascia, yet above the peritoneum. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then we get those packs all the way back there in both directions. Madeline? And do you use radio packs? We use the packs that have the radio opaque yeah. tag on it. How many of those do you use? I think you can try to, it, it depends on the patient's size, mm -hmm. but in general, you should try to get three on each side. That should be enough. You probably can get more if it's a bigger patient with a bigger pelvis. And Gina? Do you still keep a binder on it? Or? At this point, in order to do this, you have to take the binder off. Right. But once you pack, I think it's probably a good idea to put the binder back on. Uh -huh. So how many days do you keep it then? Really, this is only for about a day. A day? Yeah, 24 hours. You know, you, you get the angio, bring the patient back to the ICU, wait, resuscitate, assess the rest of the injuries. Then the next day, patient, take the patient back to the operating room and take the packs out. Does this make sense, everyone? This is a really important yeah, yeah. discussion to cover. In. You, has anyone seen this? We've done it three times here so far. OK. Right. Well, we still do it in the abdomen, Lisa. The only difference is, is that this is not opening the abdomen. So it's kind of like we're packing a leg. But we're doing it through a midline incision, which makes it a little bit more complicated. Because one could easily assume that we did an x lap here. We did not. All right, so that's why it's called pre-peritoneal packing. So remember PPP, pre-peritoneal packing. Okay, any questions on this? You know, I think you can, but I, I think it'll be a little bit harder to do so. That's why I didn't do it on Mr. O in bed seven. Right, and it just gets messy, the tissue planes get disrupted and it's just gonna be kind of hectic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll heal up. No, no. Why are you so Why are you so paranoid? At least you're you, you have a, a a saggy belly you can palpate. Look at this. And this is what it looks like. So here's the packs sitting in the pelvis. Remember, these aren't in the belly; they're preperitoneal. And there's three right here, and there's the tags of the of the pack sticking out. All right, and this is kind of the, the pre algorithm. I don't want to go through it. It's not necessary. Madeline? In special nursing care, you want us to do it? No, no. Just just, to, just to know, to know, just just to know that it's there. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's not as if it's an open belly where you've got drains coming out and, and you've got to keep an eye on the drain output. It's very different because we don't put drains in there. We just put the packs in there. All right. So just as a quick summary slide, uh, in the resuscitation phase of hemodynamically unstable patients, you gotta identify the source of pelvic hemorrhage, but that's difficult to do sometimes unless you get better imaging. Physical exam itself is hard to do so. Artery injuries can occur with pelvic fractures, but is not always the case. And both venous bleeding and bone bleeding can accompany the bleeding in a pelvic fracture. Any questions at all? Great. Well, hopefully this is of value to you. Oh, yeah. So, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.